All right. So beginning of the stream here, we're going to do episode three of our matchup guide real quick. Do the recording for that. We're going to be talking about the Death Shadow versus Hammer Time matchup. So let's go ahead and uh, hop into that. As soon as we're done there, we'll get back to some, some gameplay. So we're just going to be going over kind of like a pretty stock Grixis list, but obviously we'll go into Jund and other variations as well. And this is just like a stock hammer time list that we'll be using for most of our examples. Uh, some of the sideboard options are a little out of there, border pod, but we'll go over it as uh, some common things to expect out of hammer time as we go on. So this is one of the matchups that's been pretty popular uh, basically since like the start of MH2. Uh, Hammer Time was a little prevalent before that with Luris running around, but it got a lot more noticeable when you started adding things like Sanctifier on Vec, Esper Sentinel, Urza's Saga to the mix. Really popped uh, Hammer Time into like that tier one. Let's see, Squirfy, long time YouTube viewer, first time dropping here. Well, I appreciate you coming by and hanging out. Thanks so much for hopping on over and checking uh, checking out the channel. So, all right, as I'm saying, uh, Hammer Time since MH2 really got a lot, lot of, yeah, a lot more prevalent, really big boost in power. So that's changed a lot of how the matchup needs to be approached. So from the, the typical gameplay side, usually as the shadow side, we're trying to play a little bit of the controlling route in the first few turns, make sure we don't get comboed out quickly by a Sigardazade hammer on like an Ornithopter or Midnight that we might not be able to deal with. Uh, from the hammer side, they're usually trying to either A, win the game quickly in the blind, or post board might be more likely to try to grind out games with cards like Urza Saga, where the, the one shot kills are a lot less likely to occur. So let's go uh, over how the game typically progresses from the shadow side first. Like if you're in the blind game one, uh, cards like Sigarda's Aid, Basic Planes, maybe like Sea Chrome Coast, Esper Sentinel, something like that are usually your big tip offs that you're up against hammer time. So as soon as you realize that your focus should kind of shift from unless you have just like a quick shadow battle rage kill or something like that your focus should shift pretty aggressively to try to control the board and keep from getting just comboed out with a hammer usually game one there's a lot less uh reliance on those grindy cards the urza sagas the stone forges pure steels uh cauldras anything like that it's a lot more like all in on hammering up something. So we just need to keep from getting comboed out and dying on the spot. The first couple turns, you're usually focusing on like hand disruption. I would prioritize two for ones as aggressively as you can. So like Stoneforge Mystic, Pure Steel Paladin, uh, Sigarda's Aid's a, a solid choice, but Stoneforge, Pure Steel, things like that. Uh, blacksmith skill if you've got hand or removal spells in hand anything like that to kind of make sure that your cards are getting their most effect uh, once you start getting past those first couple of turns then you're really looking at like holding up mana interacting aggressively with things like pure steel paladin countering cigar to aids their equip mechanics are usually the the linchpin of the deck so being able to stop them from actually equipping up creatures as often as you can is usually going to be your uh, your best route game one. Game two and three, they start getting to a lot more lower equip cost cards like Sword of Fire and Ice, uh, maybe Cranial Plating, Shadow Spear, um, what's it called? Reality Chip, things like that. So the equip stopping the equip is a lot less relevant in those games but uh post board let's just go with like a typical grixis list playing against uh stock blue white hammer let's see if we can find a relatively straightforward list
Uh, maybe something kind of like this. This has got blue splash for some spell pierces. Don't really care about Lavinia. All right, so let's talk about uh the sideboarding. We'll go from their side, and then we'll kind of go into our side about how we should be counteracting what their side we're boarding in. So for most of your your hammer players, you're going to be looking at things like blacksmith skill, march of otherworldly light coming in pretty aggressively. Sometimes spell pierce and relic, but blacksmith skill, uh, march are kind of the the bigger pieces to to be considerate of. Relic can be a little bit annoying. Sanctifier on vex, a very popular one that can come in, but any of those pieces are. Uh, are typically going to be your biggest priorities when you're thinking about how I need to interact on my side. From a stock Grixis side, Alpine Moon, Dress Downs, uh, however many you got, Terminate, K Command, EE, or kind of like the the no brainers. Uh, Dress Down is probably like, if we think of these as A tier, this is like B plus tier. It's really good for stopping, like, the Stoneforge Mystic ETBs, shutting off Giver of Runes for a turn, uh, shutting off, like, Infect on Ink Moth, shutting off Pure Steel Paladin's ability to equip for a turn, stuff like that. So it's got, a, like, a lot of utility. It kills Urza Saga tokens, obviously, but for two mana, it is a, a pretty pricey effect when you have, like, Alpine Moon and EE that can do the job for a little bit cheaper. Like, I know EE is going to be two mana, zero to play, two to crack, but you can always just, like, play it out whenever you want instead of holding it up. Can Dress Down remove the Hexproof from Blacksmith skill? Yes. So, if you let the Blacksmith skill resolve, it the creature gains the abilities Hexproof and Indestructible, so then if you dress down after the blacksmith skill is resolved, you remove those abilities from the creature. But if dress down resolves first and then they blacksmith skill, it'll add those abilities back to the creature. So you do have to make uh, make sure you're okay with the timing there. Uh, spell pierce is one I've kind of toyed around with recently. We'll kind of put that like that in Turok kind of C tier. Like, they're good cards to bring in, but they're not necessarily game winners. Turok can stand in front of things like Esper Sentinel, Pure Steel Paladin, uh, es or Stoneforge Mystic, Pure Steel Paladin, Esper Sentinel, that have like a, uh, a hammer attached to them or something like that. Can also attack through a Sanctifier on Vec, which is reasonable. Dodges all of their removal. Spell Pierce on the play is decent for tagging like a turn one. Sigarda's aid uh, can hit a, a hammer in a pinch. Usually they're looking at not having a ton of mana the first couple turns. Spell Pierce can get some utility. But after those first like two or three turns, its usefulness falls off pretty aggressively. In the main board, things we're looking to cut... Usually for me, I'm looking at things like one, maybe two Kroxa. It's a lot of times going to be the biggest thing on the board, but it's also going to be slow, clunky, not really what you want to be doing on turn two with nothing else. And then like Sanctifier on Vec just absolutely wrecks the card. So it might be like board out one if I win game one, board out both if I lose game one, just to try to be more or less proactive. Uh, some number of like iteration I'll usually trim because once you get past like turn two or three, you really want to be holding up a lot of mana. And if you're tapping out on sorcery speed, you risk getting blown out by something like aid plus hammer plus blacksmith skill because you can't interact with two things at once. Uh, Ragavan can be a pretty big cut, especially on the draw. But it's pretty easy to cut, uh, at least shave on the play as well. When you're running into like Mimnite, Esper Sentinel, Ginger Brute, anything like that, and Ragavan just turns into a trade, it's uh, it's not so bad on their end, but it's pretty rough on ours. 
So that's something I would consider. And then, like, I might consider trimming some number of Thoughtseize. So, like, any of these I can consider um, reasonable cuts. Thoughtseize just because they're emptying out their hand a lot faster. So we kind of want Thoughtseize in our opening hand or never see. So if you're loaded up on four, it's more likely that you get to, like, the middle point of the game and find one off the top when you don't want it. So I usually like going down to that um, one or none kind of mentality. Like either I'm going to see the one or two uh, in the opener or I'm just not going to see this card for the rest of the match. So something reasonable could be like that seven for four five on the play, uh, maybe on the draw, something like that. I wouldn't try to nitpick too much over like Spell Pierce and Turok and stuff as long as you have these in. Or you could just go like that if you're really off of Chandler or, or really off Ragavan or trim some number of Chandler if you think they're more likely to have things like Relic of Progenitus and Sanctifier on Vec and go like 9 for 9. Like, it's... Like I said, once you get past the first like four or five cards out of the board, the effectiveness really falls off. So it just kind of comes down to what of some of these cards are you trying to get out of your deck? And if you don't really have a, a great idea of what you want to get out, then leaving a lot of these in can be fine if you just want to bring in your high impact sideboard cards. But... For the most part, anything like uh, Ancient Grudge, Abrupt Decay, Assassin's Trophy, Alpine Moon, um, Take Man, Spot Removal, any sort of sweeper effect. All those are going to be highly useful. We're looking at like a Jund list. Uh, like I said, Assassin's Trophy, Ancient Grudge, Shattering Spree, Alpine Moon, ETs. I probably wouldn't bring in Chalice. It's got a few okay spots. Like, if you're on the play and you Chalice on zero, it's not the worst thing in the world. But because so much of your interaction is on one, you don't really want to Chalice on one. And if you're not Chalicing on one against Hammer Time, then Chalice on zero is just not as impactful as you want the card to be. So I would probably just, like, leave the the chalices in the board if you're not planning on chalicing on one uh if we're looking at some of the other variants like esper or mardu or something like that uh esper to is great to bring in cards like march of otherworldly light prismatic ending you got in, any additional copies of things like fatal push are obviously fantastic um out of mardu Prismatic Endings, Terminates, Frexen's Crusader is an option, but it is kind of slow. It's kind of in that same realm as Turok. It's basically just there because it's pro-white, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily good enough to bring in against Hammer. Just option that you have available. Uh, out of the Demir list, we've got like Hercules Recall, Spreading Seas are all really good. Stubborn Denial, Solid. Dress down's good, EEs. So we've got a bunch of options for a lot of these variants. It just, again, comes down to how many cards do you think you need to get out of your main deck. Uh, in a deck like Merc Tide, I'm boarding out like probably a Merc Tide, maybe two. Depends on how aggressively I think they're attacking my graveyard. Some number of Street Wraith can come out, some number of Thought Seas. And that should correlate pretty closely. We'll say six or so. Should correlate pretty closely with like the six or seven-ish I want to bring in. So maybe something like that. Kind of have to play around with the uh, the numbers a bit for your to get your own bit of comfort. But for the most part, stick to what you you want your game plan to be like if you feel that playing the control role in a matchup like the hammer time matchup isn't where you want to be 
then lean more heavily towards playing the aggressor, keep things like the street rates and thought seizes in, board out some of the slower reactive cards, like maybe Archmage's Charm, uh, counter spell since they get an under counter, but you have drown that can double as a kill spell, stuff like that, and bring in your your interaction. And that's absolutely understandable. I just think that more often than not, on the shadow side, we're going to be playing the control route with the current shadow builds. If you're playing like an old school shadow build, there's a really good chance. Like if you're running a bunch of team or battle rages. We'll say like one of the Jun lists or something. Uh, if you're running a bunch of team or battle rages and stuff, there's a really good chance you're the aggressor game too. Like your opponent's playing uh, turn one as for Sentinel into turn two something. And you're just trying to like bully your way in with shadows and goifs and put them on the back foot. And hoping that like one ancient grudge or something is going to be enough to kind of tilt the table there. But for the current Grixis list, which is what the majority of people watching the videos are playing. Uh, you're a lot more reactive. So you can't really get to be a an aggressive beatdown deck with like Ledger Shredder and Ragavan. And stuff like that. Like you're always going to be playing the the value game. So you really need to, to lean into that if you can. So post-board gameplay. Uh, the way a lot of these matches typically play out post-board is it's pretty different play and draw, actually. So let's say you're on the play. You lost game one, you're on the play game two. Hands you really want to look at keeping are going to be things that are letting you get out on the front foot. Because if you let your opponent just play draw go for a while, they have Urza Sagas, which we cannot interact with very well outside of exactly Alpine Moon. And then we do have to deal with cards like uh, Prismatic Ending and March of Otherworldly Light that can hit Alpine Moon. So there's no guarantee it's just going to be able to sit around and wait for like the second uh, second saga, third saga, whatever. So you really need to keep a hand that gives you some sort of presence on the board. And I mean, that could be as simple as like turn one removal spell, turn two ledger shredder, or turn one thought seize, turn two ragavan or dragon's rage, or turn one dragon's rage or ragavan, turn two thought seize, whatever it is like that. But you just need to get some sort of presence on the board to be able to force the action onto your opponent so that they can't just sit back and wait forever. Uh, from the hammer side, they're really looking at being like the, the grindy value deck post board, which I know I'm saying that we're the control deck. And then Hammer's trying to be the grindy deck. They've got the better tools to be the grindy deck in situations where we're not presenting enough pressure. So like Reality Chip, Urza's Saga, uh, Chip Damage with Ink Moth Nexus. Uh, anything like that is a really good value plan for them. We've got the tools to beat all of that, and if we can beat those things, then we become the control deck. But if we can't beat those things, then they're going to be able to take over the late game pretty well. So if you do keep a hand that's got, like, uh, Thoughtseize, a couple removal spells, or removal spell expressive iteration, something like that, and you don't have a threat, I would try to make sure it's a hand with like Alpine Moon or Dress Down or Engineered Explosives, K Command, something that's a real significant impact on the board and not just like rolling over with it. Uh, Xbox Greg, thank you so much for the raid. Hope you had an awesome stream. Welcome, welcome everybody. We're going through episode three of our matchup guide real quick, talking about the, the Death Shadow versus Hammer Time matchup. And as soon as we get through with this, just in like a few minutes, we're going to start some gameplay. Uh, not sure what variation of Shadow we're playing yet, but we'll figure it out between now and then. 
but we're just about to wrap this up since hammer time is a pretty straightforward matchup uh some common play patterns to look for is like if your opponent leads turn one giver of runes on the draw or on the play or the draw post board i would focus heavily 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 on killing that giver because if you don't and they just untap and play a stoneforge mystic and they're able to get a cauldra then chances are pretty slim to none that you're beating that cauldra but if you answer the giver even if you don't have another removal spell you give yourself the chance of top decking one for the stoneforge mystic instead of just being auto dead to it uh other than that, Sigarda's Aid with like a zero drop on turn one can be a little scary. Uh, if that's the case, it seems a little counterintuitive, but more often than not, I would lead on hand disruption into that. There's the chance that your opponent has a hammer, but since a lot of their ways of getting a hammer or getting value off a hammer are two mana, like having Pure Steel Paladin and then a hammer after to draw a card or Stoneforge to get a hammer, there's a reasonable chance that you can take something like that with a hand disruption, then untap, still have removal spell. If your opponent does hammer up one of those zero drops on turn two, as long as they don't double hammer, they might put you in a position to play down a death shadow that's bigger than the creature that they hammered up. Or you can always play out like a Dragon's Rage Chandler or Ragavan, something like that to block. In terms of priority of your removal spells, Fatal Push is S tier. Kills anything, regardless of how big it is, regardless of how many hammers. You just have to worry about Blacksmith skill. Uh, the A tier behind that, Terminate, Drown in the Lock, and Unholy Heat are both like B tier, where nine times out of ten, they're going to kill what you want to kill, but there's the occasional time where like, your opponent's got a construct that's too big for heat. You're probably losing that anyway. Or you've got Drown and Lock, and they've got a Sanctifier on Vec and one card in their yard, and you need to kill a Pure Steel. Situations like that come up from time to time. Uh, K Command is kind of in that C tier. Like, it's good. Obviously, hitting any artifact is nice. Two damage is going to kill most creatures. That's nice. But at three mana, it's a really big ask. Like, I would never recommend K commanding on your main phase or inside of your opponent's combat unless they're tapped out and you know you're going to hit what you need to hit. And there's no way of them untapping and killing you. So I would always try to go for K command somewhere like end of your opponent's turn to where if they do have a response, you're not just getting completely blown out by it. Uh, e, another one I'd probably put in like A plus tier. It's obviously the effect is phenomenal, wiping out like all the one drops or something on board. Uh, but you usually don't want to play it out too early because then your opponent has a chance to either get like Pithing Needle off of an Urza Saga, which they might do in the blind anyway or just not play their one drops into it so you really want to set up a spot where you can like play it out and crack it and potentially hold up like some piece of interaction after that so like turn four or something play out an ee on one crack it hold up a fatal push is phenomenal but because it gets to that point of the game that turn four five six to really be maximum effectiveness it gets bumped down from s tier but E is a great answer to like Sanctifier on Vec. E on two can be very relevant with like Pure Steel, Stone Forge, Reality Chip, Sanctifier, uh, all that sort of stuff. So just be a little bit careful there, not to to throw it out with like no plan in mind. But do be weary that if you're relying on that EE to win you the game and your opponent's got an Urza Saga, there's a reasonable chance they're going to get a Pithing Needle and just blind name EE since it is one of the few cards that can like absolutely decimate a board stall. Um, other than that, I think that's about it for that matchup. 
Let's double check, see if there's anything or any other cards that I'm not thinking of. So like Kozilex Return is one we've played in the past. It's been very solid. Hit Sanctifier on Vec. Uh, sweeps away most of the small guys. Every now and then you'll have an opponent giver of runes and name red when you Kozilex Return. And you're like, ha ha ha, colorless. Um, what else? Dismember is a really, really good card against them because it actually deals with Cauldra Complete. So that's one you can consider if you're running it in any list. Uh, Collector Oof is solid. Pithing Needle, if you're running it in your board, is a good option. If you're on some sort of Saga list or if you're just running it because Pithing Needle... Uh, it's great to be able to name like Urza's Saga. You can name um, Colossus Hammer if they've got a a pure steel down. And you don't want them to be able to like play and equip a hammer. You can name Stoneforge Mystic to stop them from getting uh, equipment in under like counter spells and stuff. Let's see, is there anything else? You could name Shadow Spear, but for the most part, you don't really care about Shadow Spear, so I wouldn't. Highly recommend that one. I believe that's about it. Unless anybody's got any uh, specific questions. Worth mentioning, Cigar to Zay gets around with it. Yes, you are correct. So if your opponent has a Cigar to Zay and they cast a hammer or something, they're not paying uh, an activation cost to equip the hammer. Cigar to Zay triggers, lets them equip the hammer for free. Uh, so it does get around Collector Oof. But Oof is decent for like stopping Springleaf drums, uh, stopping any sort of artifact that's on the board from getting equipped with like a pure steel paladin. Uh, anything like that stops like Relic of Progenitus, stops your opponent from uh, reconfiguring a reality chip. So things like that can have some usefulness. Um, anything else we've played in the past that's been workly useful? think there's anything yeah nothing that immediately comes to mind uh we've had a bunch of wins with like team or battle rage with opponents uh, like just going all out on the offensive and making an aggressive attack and we got to surprise them on the backswing with battle rage because they were like 17 18 life and didn't think there was any way they could possibly die uh, Core Outfitter also gets around Collector Oof, just in case that's one anybody happens to run into. Yeah, I can't really think of anything else, so let's go ahead and wrap this up here. Usually I find the matchup to be like slightly favorable. On the shadow side, I think it gets more favorable if you're playing something like Jund and you get access to cards like Ren and Six, Ancient Grudge, Abrupt Decay if you want it, whatever, uh, Battle Rage. But for a lot of like the Grixis builds, if you're not able to get a decent board presence, it gets significantly worse, significantly faster.